Dr. Ward is here, so we can start. I just want to let you know I have to leave early. Like That's very, okay. Very early, like right away. Well, then you leave right away. No, nothing against that. <laughs> Hey, that's okay. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll get started here. And I just want to say that uh, I think I can speak on behalf of all the residents, fellows, and faculty that have worked with Dr. Uh, Chris Conradi that we're very glad he came here to the Moran to join our residency program. Uh, he came to us from the MD-PhD program at the uh, D. McGee Eye Center in Oklahoma. And he's been uh, the VA intern for the last uh, three to four months. Um, in his role there, Dr. Conradi has been incredibly efficient, coming in after uh, his morning runs at uh, 6.30 to churn through the paperwork, and even uh, being so ahead that he can see retina clinic patients in addition to his regular clinic loads. Uh, he apparently was also a model of efficiency during his PhD years turning out 10 first author papers in three short years. And we really look forward to hearing more about that PhD work. Uh, but before uh, we hear from Dr. Conradi, I just want to share a little story um, about how I found out that his nickname was Kamikaze. Um, as part of the resident retreat, uh, Renee, Chris, and I uh, went on a little mountain biking trip to the Flying Dog, uh, Jeremy Ranch. Uh, there's a particularly steep uh, downhill switchback, and Dr. Conradi cut it a little bit too close and hit his front brake a little too hard. Um, he started a headfirst dive over the handlebars. I'm behind him, envisioning uh, really bad consequences for him and for me who took him down this trail. Uh, however, in midair, Dr. Conradi managed to convert this headfirst over the handlebars momentum into a flying hurdle of his handlebars and land uh, on his feet in a run uh, five feet down the trail and uh, managed to avoid the aspens on the other side. Um, I would say that if uh, reaction times during uh, mountain biking crashes have anything to do with surgical skill, uh, Dr. Conradi will turn out to be a very excellent cataract surgeon. And with that, uh, we look forward to hearing about uh, his PhD work. Thanks, Dr. Wong. Um, so like Dr. Wong said, I will be talking about some of my PhD work. Um, and I've entitled this talk, Innate Recognition of HSV-1, A View from Within the Cornea. And we'll talk much deeper about this topic, probably to the point that you guys are sick of hearing about innate immunity. But just to kind of give you a good context of that, we'll go through it. Um, then I first got my interest in the scientific world from actually kind of a different um, background. I was actually first introduced to the sciences uh, in the botanical world, and so I've always had a fascination with science from actually uh, the botanical side. And for those of you that know flowers or don't know flowers, this is a lily of the Nile, and I've transposed uh, some different colors on top of that. Uh, I haven't genetically modified the flowers, which uh, is what Eileen was thinking I'd done to this flower, but no, I've not genetically modified it. Uh, and so first, let me tell you, to every story, there's the good guy and the bad guy. And so to introduce you to a, a topic that we all interact with almost on a daily basis is herpes simplex virus type 1. It's a highly prevalent DNA virus. Uh, it's neurotropic. Um, 60 to 90 percent of the population is seropositive for the actual virus, meaning that they've been infected at some point and likely harbor the virus, whether they actually sh show symptomatic signs of that. Um, is very, very broad spectrum, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. The reason that we were interested in this topic, obviously, from uh, the Dean McGee Eye Institute perspective, was that it's the leading cause of corneal blindness due to infectious etiology in the developed world. Um, so basically, we see it quite a bit, um, and that was the reason that we became interested in it. And just a little foreshadowing to the rest of the talk that I'll give um, is that Herpes simplex is shown to activate toll-like receptor 2, 3, 7, and 9, and several other innate sensors, and we'll go in excruciating detail uh, over this topic, um, but that's just a little foreshadowing. Then the interesting thing that you all know about herpes simplex is that it has a wide array of symptoms, uh, clinical symptoms, and so we have patients um, that come in that don't have any symptoms at all, 
then in the context of HSV2, um, a very close uh, relative of HSV1, you can actually get females that asymptomatically shed HSV2 into the vaginal uh, vault, um, basically spreading the virus uh, without even having symptoms of the virus itself. Then that can progress, or not necessarily progress, but in other cases you can get um, kind of a nuisance uh, cold sore. Uh, then as we progress in more, uh, in increasing morbidity and mortality, we can get corneal infections where you get the um, kind of pathognomonic uh, dendritic staining of the cornea, and that's what we'll be focusing on today. And then a little bit of my work touched on herpes encephalitis, where you actually can get mortality, and actually in 70% of those that survive, uh, you'll get long-term neurological deficits. And so it's a pretty broad spectrum um, when it comes to clinical symptomology. Uh, and then to introduce to you the good guys, and this will be something that we um, focus most of this talk on, uh, is the uh, immune system. So the immune system comes in two flavors to dust off, uh, dust off all those cobwebs from immune classes in medical school and in graduate school. Uh, there's two um, flavors of immunity. The first, the innate nonspecific arm uh, that's driven by NK cells, macrophages, and actual host cells themselves. Uh, and it's based on these conserved pathogen-associated molecular patterns where you have a pathogen that has a conserved sequence and then these innate sensors respond to those conserved sequences. Then uh, that's in contrast to the adaptive or more specific arm of the uh, immune system um, that's driven by T and B cells. And this is a very, very um, basic uh, form of Im immunology, but just to kind of give you a basic grasp of it um, for those of you that haven't really thought about immune system in a while. Um, but we're going to focus on this first half, the innate, or the innate immune system um, that's driven by this, uh, by toll-like receptors, DNA, and RNA sensors, and we'll go in more detail as we go. So what exactly are innate sensors? So in the most basic form, think of a watchtower on a castle. So they're literally surveying the surrounding tissue uh, inside the cell itself, depending on the, the sensor itself, and so they're trying to activate um, the earliest immune response to invading pathogens. Uh, and so that's driven by toll-like receptors, DNA sensors, RNA sensors, um, so there's a whole broad spectrum of innate sensors. Uh, and as uh, over the last probably 20 years, uh, toll-like receptors were first hypothesized uh, in the late 1980s, then identified actually in the mid-1990s. However, in the last three years, uh, three or four years, we'll say, DNA and RNA sensors have become, um, I guess, a center part of the innate immune system. Uh, and then they, like I said, they've activate the innate immune system, and they do that by inducing the production of chemokines, so basically molecules that attract infiltrating leukocytes to the site of infection. They also drive a pro-inflammatory state with pro-inflammatory cytokines and they upregulate cell surface receptors, and probably the key um, that we'll talk about today is they drive interferon production. Um, and from the context of toll-like receptors, I need you to kind of focus on this, and I'll boil down the innate immune system to three points I want you to hold on to, and this is one of them, but we'll rehash that here in a second. But all toll-like receptors signal through one of two adapter proteins, either MITE88 or TRIP. So all signaling through the 12 or 13 toll-like receptors, depending on um, who you're talking to, signal through one of these two adapter proteins. Uh, and then just to kind of overwhelm you with uh, actual innate immunity. So this is showing just RNA and DNA sensors and the pathways that they drive. Doesn't show the 12 or 13 toll-like receptors that have been identified as well. Um, but you can see that it's a very complex uh, process, uh, driving basically to lead to the production of the interferon and driving interferon uh, uh, pro uh, products. And so to kind of boil that down, to kind of, uh, I guess, dumb that down to just HSV-related uh, sensors, and so in the literature, you can dig through the literature and see that there are three toll-like receptors that actually drive innate immunity in some context to HSV, and that's toll-like receptor 2, 3, and 9. Uh, and then there are three DNA sensors that have been identified, DAI, DDX41, and IFI16. And then there's a controversial role of an RNA sensor 
or maybe it's actually two sensors, rig I MDA5. Uh, that still shows that this is a pretty complex uh, process and what exactly is happening is hard to identify in a lot of tissues due to the complexity of the in immune, innate immune system. But just to boil that down a little bit further, so if we want to look at basically the most basic innate immune response, all innate immunity basically drives an NF-kappa B signaling cascade to drive pro-inflammatory cytokine production, to drive a pro-inflammatory state. And then from the antiviral perspective, you have IRF, so interferon regulatory factor protein is phosphorylated, dimerizes, nuclear translocates to drive interferon production. And so those are the most downstream signaling portions of these innate sensors. And so we'll be looking at a lot of those signaling cascades, but we'll talk more about them and I'll continue to rehash that as we go. Uh, then, um, if, at least from an antiviral state, uh, interferon is then re released um, once the innate sensor is activated and activates interferon production. Interferon is released from the cell, then um, is basically binds in an autocrine and paracrine manner. So to the cell itself and then to surrounding cells to this heterodimeric interferon receptor. That it then activates what you all are probably most familiar with, um, the JAK-STAT signaling cascade. We're not gonna talk much about that today, but basically to say that the JAK-STAT signaling cascade is important in, dri in driving um, basically interferon regu regulatory proteins to drive antiviral immunity to viruses. Then interferons themselves, so what exactly are interferons? They're antiviral cytokines. They're produced following these innate sensor um, activation. Um, and they activate a couple of proteins that are important in antiviral immunity. So PKR, RNA cell, they induce apoptosis, increase MHC class one presentation, and just to dust off the cobwebs of immunology, that's important in cytotoxic CD8 T cell surveillance of whether a cell needs to um, be killed because it's infected or whether it's actually just host tissue that's being presented and the cytotoxic T cell goes on its way. All these proteins and pathways are basically, um, I guess, activated to reduce the amount of virus uh, or the ability of the virus to replicate. So if you kill the cell itself, so if you basically go on a kamikaze mission and basically destroy yourself, the virus can't replicate in a dead cell. Uh, PKR and RNA cell both basically degrade all intracellular protein. So it's very difficult for a virus that hijacks intracellular proteins um, to replicate itself to do that when there are no proteins to replicate with. Uh, and then lastly, um, obviously the sensitivity of MHC class one ex um, expression. Um, and this kind of shows the role of interferons bridging innate immunity with adaptive immunity. There's currently six subtypes of interferons known. Uh, two of them we'll talk about today because they seem to may be the predominant in antiviral uh, interferons. And like I said, I would boil this down to three key points that I need you to hold on to for the rest of the talk because I present some data. The first being something I've already uh, basically hounded on, and that's that all toll-like receptors signal through either this TRIP or Mighty88 adapter protein. And don't worry if you forget some of these things, we'll hound on them a little bit more later. Uh, then interferon production requires the nuclear translocation of these IRF subspecies, so these interferon regulatory factor proteins. Uh, and so if you don't get that nuclear translocation, you don't get interferon production. Then lastly, the activation of downstream interferon proteins results in increased cell death, decreased cell sensitivity to actual viral infection. And so that's the key component of interferon. Um, so then to take you through the literature up to date, um, what we knew going into this study, uh, at least from toll-like receptors and innate immunity in the cornea. Uh, and so it was very clear um, from literature that both bacterial and fungal infections require toll-like receptor signals to clear the infection in the cornea. So if you knock out toll-like receptors, you get an increased sensitivity to bacteria and fungus. Then it was widely assumed that interferon production uh, was actually driven by toll-like receptors in the cornea. Um, and that was actually in part by a study that took human corneal epithelial cells and treated those with toll-like receptor 3 agonists. And then they noted that interferon beta 
was actually produced. Uh, then lastly, um, groups have gone through and taken uh, corneal transplant, well, tissues that are uh, of patients that are getting corneal transplants after HSV-1 infection of the cornea and noted that TLR mRNA is actually upregulated during HSV-1 infections, suggesting that the virus or at least the immune system is upregulating its innate sensors to increase sensitivity to surveying the surrounding tissue. That would at least be the hypothesis from what they proposed. So then the two questions that kind of immediately popped up in our head was what drives innate recognition of HSV-1 in the cornea? And nobody had really nailed that down. And probably the more important question um, that, uh, is why should we care? And so let me first target that second question. So for those of you that keep up with any sort of vaccine literature, um, there's no HSV-1 or 2 vaccine on the market. Secondly, there have been multiple failed attempts, most recently in 2012, uh, where actually it showed an increased susceptibility to HSV infection. So not a great virus, or not a great vaccine. <laughs> then there's emerging literature that would actually suggest, uh, well actually not suggest, it's pretty firmly established at this point by multiple groups around the world that in order to get an efficacious vaccine, you have to activate the proper innate immune sensor. Uh, and so, there, like I've already shown you, there's a dozen, and I didn't even show you all the innate immune sensors, there's a dozen of them. And so if you're making a vaccine with only a protein product, but you actually need to activate the RNA sensor or the DNA sensor to create an efficacious vaccine, you're not going to get an efficacious vaccine. Then the other half of that, at least from the ophthalmology perspective, is that the therapeutic options in herpetic infections of the cornea are rather, um, let's say, um, I guess, uh, there's you have two choices. You start antivirals and then whether you start glucocorticoids or not later um, is kind of the, the question. Um, and so we'll talk about this as we go, but is there a more specific therapy possible? Because um, we all know the systemic, well not necessarily systemic, but the side effects of glucocorticoids and then also I'll kind of allude on some of that as we go. Uh, and then, um, for, let's return back to this question of what drives innate recognition of HSV-1 in the cornea. And so to kind of introduce you to the first model, uh, we basically use the mouse model in which we scarify corneas, topically inoculate HSV-1 onto the cornea, and then we can look at uh, specific time points um, compared to uninfected controls, and then we'll actually use global knockouts of specific proteins to look at the innate immune system in the cornea, at least in mice. Then we can do anything basically you could ever think of. Uh, plaque assay, we'll use plaque assays basically where we grind up the corneas and then we can evaluate the amount of virus in the tissue by adding the tissue to Vero cells and then HSV will actually form a plaque and so we can actually count the amount of plaques in the tissue um, to give us a good logarithmic um, idea of how much virus is in the tissue. Then we can do all sorts of imaging um, and we'll kind of walk through some of this. Some of this data I actually won't show you. So then our first question became, if interferon beta seems to be the predominant subtype produced during interferon infection, or at least when you treat cells with toll-like receptor 3 agonists, what is actually the predominant interferon subspecies when it comes to HSV-1 infection? Uh, and so we looked at both interferon alpha and beta. They're the predominant interferon sub, or antiviral subtypes of the six interferons I suggested earlier. And so we looked at interferon beta. I don't show that data here due to time. But basically, all interferon beta is restricted to the limbus and infiltrating leukocytes. Uh, then if we look at interferon alpha, you can see here in the middle panel, and this is kind of a busy panel, but I'll just kind of quickly highlight some of this, that if we look at HSV-1 infections, so HSV-infected cells are in red, blue is uh, nuclei, so it's DAPI staining, and then interferon alpha is in green. We see that it seems to be interferon alpha that's actually produced by virally infected cells. And then also that it's the surrounding, uh, as you see here with this yellow arrow, that it cells that are uninfected will actually secrete the interferon uh, alpha as well. And that's not a surprise since it binds in an autocrine and paracrine manner to basically reduce uh, the ability of virus to spread. So then at this point, we already were scratching our heads thinking, okay, it's not interferon beta that seems to be driving the innate immune system in the cornea, but it seems to be interferon alpha. So then we took all the literature we had um, 
at the time and basically hypothesize what much of you would hypothesize at the time with the data that I've shown you. That the loss of toll-like receptor signaling reduces HSV1 containment in the cornea due to loss of type 1 interferon production. And to first touch on that, we have, uh, and I'll refer to it as our gold standard mouse, but it's a, a mouse that is deficient in one of the heterodimeric proteins of the interferon receptor. And so when you knock it out, you get no jack stat signaling, and therefore you activate no antiviral pathways, at least when it comes to interferon. However, the mouse is still able to produce interferon, it just cannot respond to the signal. And so if we show you how susceptible these mice are to infection, uh, this slide is very busy, but basically to boil it down to this. If you compare these knockout mice uh, to wild-type controls, you can clearly see that by th in three days post-infection, in almost any tissue you look at in a mouse's body, you have significantly more virus. So if you look in the brain stem, the trigeminal ganglia, the lymph node, the spleen, the thymus, and then you can actually show that these uh, mice um, well, in these type 1 interferon receptor deficient mice, that the virus is actually able to go viremic. These mice get extremely sick by day 5 or day 6 post infection. 90 to 100 percent of these mice are dead by day 5 post infection, uh, likely from an encephalitis. So they're extremely susceptible to the virus and um, showing the extreme role of type 1 interferon in uh, antiviral immunity. Then if we look at the complications of, the, um, of what happens when, at least from a pathological standpoint, of when we knock out type 1 interferon signaling in the cornea, we can show you here on the left is a wild type control at five days post-infection, and then here, sorry, the image quality is not the best, but here on the right, you can see that you get a ton of edema and actual stroma itself infiltrating neutrophils, and I don't show the flow cytometry to confirm that, um, but we've confirmed that then you basically lose all epithelium of the actual CD118 mouse, showing that uh, these mice are extremely susceptible and has pathological consequences in the cornea. Then um, we can basically con conclude at this point that interferon is critical in host defense against the ocular HSV infection, and we'll go down that road a little bit more. Um, and then secondly, that the loss of interferon signals results in rapid dissemination and death of the host. So these are absolutely critical signals. Then to get back to our hypothesis of whether toll-like receptors are responsible for driving innate immunity, we then took protein or mice deficient in proteins in TRIF and MITE88, so the adapter proteins to all toll-like receptors, compared those to wild-type controls, and then our gold standard, the type 1 interferon or CD118 deficient mouse. Uh, and we can see from this that the loss of those toll-like receptors has no effect on viral containment. Um, and then if we wanted to then, uh, that's at five days post-infection, and these are using those plaque assays to quantify the amount of virus in the cornea. We then look at 24 hours post-infection, it appears that the role of type 1 interferons, um, at least uh, that we can appreciate from plaque assays, is somewhere after 24 hours post-infection. Um, and so then at this point, and this isn't actually a completely firm uh, conclusion, but the loss of toll-like receptor signaling has no effect on HSV containment in the cornea when compared to CD118 mice five days post-infection. Um, and so your question probably, or maybe you haven't really thought about this yet, but quickly became apparent in my mind is what if a toll-like receptor, if you knock out that signal, if another toll-like receptor can actually pick up the slack and actually recovers for missing toll-like receptor. So if we're only knocking out one adapter protein, there are other toll-like receptors that can signal. And so I told you there's three toll-like receptors that have all shown some role in HSV innate immunity. And so if we have others to cover for it, um, if we're only knocking out one adapter protein, then we may not be identifying the actual compensatory mechanism. So what we did is we actually back-crossed these toll-like receptor adapter protein deficient mice into a double knockout. And you see that when we knock out both toll-like receptor adapter proteins, it has no effect on viral containment in the, con the cornea, uh, which would highly suggest that the loss of toll-like receptors has no effect on innate immunity in the cornea. And then just to kind of further solidify this, uh, I don't show the double knockout here, but it has a basic, uh, basic finding that you see here. Um, you still see interferon production in all of these mice. And like I said, CD118 mice can still produce interferon 
They just can't respond to the signal because of the receptor. Uh, then if we look down here, and it's kind of small, and I apologize for that, but basically some of the interferon regulatory proteins, uh, we looked at a few of those by real-time PCR, and they're activated in much the same way as wild-type controls in our toll-like receptor adapter protein deficient mice. Uh, and so basically we can conclude at that point that the loss of toll-like receptors has no effect on downstream signaling, uh, at least when it comes to innate immunity. And I don't show this, but the NF-kappa-B signaling cascades to this toll-like receptor pathway or not, not toll-like receptor pathway, uh, NF-kappa-B doesn't vary in that as well. And so it's NF-kappa-B and the interferon production that seem to be completely fine even if you knock out toll-like receptors. So then probably the biggest question uh, that had us scratching our heads for quite some time is what is driving interferon production and NF-kappa-B signaling despite a loss in toll-like receptors? So I've already told you that there are DNA sensors, there's RNA sensors, and probably any graduate student's worst nightmare is that you're going on a fishing experiment for an unknown protein. Uh, and so we decided to then look at what was known uh, and then go with that. So I've already shown you that toll-like receptor 2, 3, and 9 um, through the loss of toll-like receptor adapter proteins seemed to have no effect in the cornea. Uh, so then that brought us to four sensors, which seemed manageable unless it was an unknown sensor. And so we have, I'll first start with rig IMDA5, so that's an RNA sensor. Uh, and in the literature, if you dig back, there's been a couple of reports in regards to HSV innate surveillance. Um, and they're not real strong reports. In fact, others have actually suggested that there's another sensor actually covering for the loss of rig IMDA5, and so that it doesn't appear that they play a significant role in HSV surveillance. So then that brought us to the DNA sensors, and so for the first DNA sensor actually identified was DAI, um, and I'm not gonna tell you the actual full-length names of these proteins that are much easier just to give you the abbreviated, because these are like four or five word long proteins and it would just get very, very difficult to follow. Uh, so DAI um, had been shown that if you knock out DAI in macrophages, you lose interferon beta production in, res in regards to HSV infection. However, if you take a mouse that's deficient in DAI, has no effect on viral containment, suggesting that DAI wasn't the innate sensor that we were looking for because we're looking for a sensor that makes the mouse exquisitely sensitive to the virus itself. Then DDX41 was actually a recently identified protein um, that had a similar role of DAI, had been, been shown to play a role in macrophages, but not much more than that. Then kind of the, the protein that we decided to hang our hats on, at least from a research perspective, was IFI16. So I literally walked in, so this paper was published in Nature Immunology as I'm trying to figure out the innate sensor um, responsible for HSV surveillance in the cornea. A uh, paper was published in Nature Immunology. The next morning I walk into my mentor's um, office and I say, after six months of coming up empty-handed, that I know what the innate sensor is. And he was like, Chris, how can you be so confident in that? Um, and it was due to the fact that this um, sensor had just been shown to drive an interferon response in regards to HSV infection in macrophages. So similar story, that's how most DNA, RNA sensors are identified in macrophages. However, the other literature, if you dig back to the n late 1970s and early 1980s, is that IFI-16 is actually expressed in prostate epithelium, that when it is mutated, prostate cancers now proliferate unabated, and so that would actually suggest, remember I told you interferons were critical in apoptosis, uh, and so it had been known for quite some time that if you lose interferon signaling in cancers, that cancers proliferate. Uh, and so we were looking at a, a protein that seemed to be regulating more than just interferon beta production in macrophages in regards to HSV infection, that it seemed to have some role in other tissues, uh, specifically in prostate epithelium. And while the prostate is not the same as the cornea, it at least was an epithelial tissue, and so it was at least something that we could kind of grasp at that point. And so first we had to identify whether this protein was even expressed in corneal epithelium. And so you can see here, this is DAPI, uh, staining of the nuclei. Then P204 is the mouse homologue of IFI-16, and we have staining for that in red. And you can clearly see that it's localized to both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And I didn't hound on this, but this protein actually goes back and forth from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. So it's no surprise that you see it in both places. 
Uh, then to kind of further hang our hats on this, we knew that the epithelial tissue is uh, extremely sensitive to HSV infection, and so this virus was, or this uh, innate sensor was predominantly expressed in the corneal epithelium, as you see here. And let me use this instead. As you see here um, in this 3D reconstruction of the cornea. So this is the epithelial tissue here, then the stroma here, and then endothelium you can't really uh, appreciate very well here, but most of it's actually expressed in the epithelial tissue. Then we did something that we didn't actually think would work, but that's a lot of science, I guess. And so we took mice, uh, we actually uh, anesthetized them, then transfected them uh, with siRNA to a control, um, and then also mice with a P204 to knock down that protein um, to see if it had any effect on HSV surveillance because there was no global knockout of P204 IFI 16. And you can clearly see here that P2, the loss of P204 results in increased susceptibility to HSV infection. However, you're probably thinking, well, that isn't near as drastic as what we saw earlier. And so we first thought that maybe that was due to the fact that we were using a different model. Um, but probably the bigger thing was that when we looked at the actual knockdown of how much knockdown we're actually getting, we were getting anywhere from 40 to 50 percent knockdown of that protein of P204, so of IFI 16 in the cornea. And so that would probably mitigate a large um, portion of what we're seeing. Um, however, we would then wanted to look a little further, and like I said, IRF subspecies are translocated to the nucleus after activation of innate sensors. And so if we look at the cytoplasmic portion of IRF3, which is the important IRF, in, at least in regards to interferon alpha, we can see that there's really no difference in the cytoplasmic portion of IRF3. However, you can clearly see that when we knock out P204 with this 50 percent knockdown, that you lose a good portion of the nuclear portion of IRF3, suggesting that we're losing the signal to drive interferon production uh, with the loss of P204. Uh, then just to kind of further solidify that, we then took mice, did the exact same thing, transfected them, infected them, and then did whole mounts and looked 48 hours post-infection. And you can see here that in our control, you get interferon alpha production just like we saw previously. However, when we knock down P204, uh, you lose that interferon alpha production uh, in the cornea, uh, further solidifying the role of P204 IFI 16 in interferon production in the cornea. So then to take you back to this signaling cascade, like I said, we'd continue to re return to this just to remind you, I have to remind myself as well, uh, that IFI 16 has an adapter protein, Sting, Sting then activates another protein that then activates another protein, and there's probably five or six proteins that I don't show here. Needless to say, it activates interferon regulatory factors, so IRF, nuclear translocation, to drive interferon production. So we did know that there was a sting-deficient mouse out on the market, um, and so we actually contacted a group um, and wanted to look at what the loss of sting had in the cornea, so the downstream adapter protein of our uh, IFI 16 P204. So you can clearly see here that the loss of sting in CD118, there's no difference between their viral control at 48 hours post-infection. Furthermore, both of them are significantly elevated when it comes to the amount of virus you can recover from the cornea, further solidifying the role of IFI 16 P204 in viral surveillance of the cornea. So then um, what probably any um, clinician uh, then begins to ask, is this just a mouse phenomenon? Uh, and so we wanted to kind of attest to that. So we took an immortalized uh, corneal epithelial cell line and wanted to first see if IFI-16 was expressed in that cell line. And you can see that there's a protein with a predicted size of IFI-16, and then if we actually do confocal microscopy of these cells, at least in this portion of the cell cycle, most of the IFI-16 protein is localized to the nucleus, but it is expressed. Furthermore, if we then look at IRF nuclear translocation, so if we use control, if we use siRNA to knock down IFI-16 and compare that to controls, and we quantified this, uh, but I'll show you the sexy images instead, um, you get clear nuclear translocation, as you can see here with purple staining where you have red and blue overlapping, showing the nuclear portion of IRF. However, when you knock down IFI-16, that protein 
is restricted to the cytoplasm, showing that it's not activated and actually being moved or translocated. Uh, furthermore, if you knock down IFI-16, you have a significant rise in the amount of recoverable virus from these cells. Uh, then, like any good Oklahoman, we like to fish, and so the literature up to this point in innate immunity had basically referred to sensors, very specifically as sensors, due to the fact that no one had actually shown that these innate sensors actually directly interact with the protein, DNA, or RNA that they're sensing, or that they're just kind of prodding along, sensing the environment around. And so what we did is we took these human corneal epithelial cells, we transfected DNA, very similar uh, sequences to HSV, into these human corneal epithelial cells. We then cross-linked all proteins in the cells, lysed the cells, then used IFI-16 antibody to then pull down. Um, and then we could clearly show that when you have IFI-16, you pull down DNA, both single strand and DNA, uh, double strand DNA products that we've transfected into the cell. Um, however, when you don't have IFI-16 or if you don't have DNA products, you don't pull anything down, suggesting that there is a direct actual sensing of IFI-16 with DNA in the host cell. Whether that's actually cytoplasmic, this would actually probably suggest that it's cytoplasmic because it's very difficult to get proteins into the nucleus. Um, or I'm, I'm DNA and the actual nucleus. Uh, this would suggest that it's a cytoplasmic interaction, but it's still debatable at this point whether this interaction actually takes place in a cytoplasm where a virus would actually release its DNA products to then traffic into the nucleus or whether this is actually in the nucleus occurring. Um, so then the next question became, does this uh, happen with other pathogens? So are we just finding a, a nice phenomenon that just so happens to work in every model that we've checked so far? It didn't. I'm just showing you the highlights. There were a lot of uh, negative data in this whole process. And so if we look at an RNA virus, uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, and I can clearly show you here with real-time PCR because it's not a platforming virus, so this would be a way that we could quantify the amount of virus that when you lose our type 1 interferon signal, you lose the ability to contain the virus. So type 1 interferons are critical in the innate, innate immune response to VSV. However, if you knock down P204, it does not have the same effect of losing <coughs> P204 in regards to HSV infection, suggesting that, or I guess solidifying that this is a DNA sensor, IFI 16 P204, and that at least at this point, it's HSV specific, but it's likely all DNA viruses. Then to kind of give you a model of what I've shown so far and some of this data I haven't shown you because uh, just due to time constraints, virus replicates in epithelial tissue, it's then, act then activates P204 IFI-16 to then activate Sting and then probably a half dozen other proteins to then lead to the activation and dimerization and phosphorylation of IRF to the nuclear translocate to drive interferon alpha production. And what I haven't shown is interferon alpha production while it, while it drives PKR, uh, RNA cell, apoptosis of cells, and MHC class one expression. Um, we also show that it actually binds to the upstream promoter of a chemokine that's in critical in driving inflammatory monocytes to the site of infection. So while I'm showing you the major portion of an innate immunity, there is a bone marrow derived response. Uh, while it is small, it is significant and it seems to be driven by inflammatory monocytes. Um, then uh, I don't show the data on this, but uh, in the vaginal mucosa, so in epithelial tissue, it seems to be the same response. So we actually knocked down IFI 16 P204 uh, in mice and then infected with HSV2, and you get a significant rise in the amount of virus. Um, however, we knew from literature uh, that there's a group of children in France that are highly susceptible to recurrent herpetic encephalitis. And that has been, I guess, remotely connected to a loss of toll like receptor 3 signaling. And so we knew that um, when toll like receptors were first identified, uh, the person, he actually didn't win the Nobel Prize and was kind of a controversial thing but a friend of his won the Nobel Prize for toll-like receptors. The guy that actually identified toll-like receptors hypothesized 
the toll-like receptors are omnipotent. Uh, they actually drive all innate immunity in all cells and all tissues. Well, it seems like a very strong statement, um, and we were seeing something somewhat different, and so we wanted to first test that. And so if we look in the central nervous system, and I'm only going to show briefly uh, this just because I think it's interesting, uh, and the loss of t type 1 interferon seems to be critical, um, and you get HSV infection of ependymal cells. Uh, then you can further confirm that you lose the cilia of ependymal cells, you get some red blood cell hemorrhaging uh, in those sites uh, that you don't see in wild type controls, and these mice get extremely swollen heads. Uh, have neurological pathology that would be any neuropathologist's dream, um, but I'm not going to show any of that, but to then go on to show that human ependymal cells are actually extremely susceptible to the virus. Um, however, it seems to be that if we take mouse brains and we actually take 200 micron sections of mouse brains and keep them alive on uh, tissue culture, uh, in tissue culture, we can show that if you lose the TRIF adapter protein, so the toll-like toll -like receptor 3 adapter protein, that when you lose that, you lose innate immunity in the actual central nervous system. Then if you deplete macrophages with clodronate, it's a very specific depletion, that you actually lose that. So it seems to be toll-like receptor 3 in macrophages that's driving innate immunity in the central nervous system. So to conclude, um, the loss of P204-IFI-16 results in enhanced viral susceptibility. Uh, I've pretty clearly shown that. Then interferons play a crucial antiviral role in the cornea, as well as the entire uh, host. Uh, then the role of toll-like receptor 3 in IFI-16 is tissue-specific. Uh, and that actually got us a lot of heat as we were trying to publish some of these papers um, as a Nobel Prize, I guess, uh, non-winner, but should have been winner. Uh, was re reviewing our papers. Um, and then lastly, that P204 IFI 16 drives na recognition of HSV in the cornea. And it's, I don't show, well, I didn't show as strong of data for the human uh, side of that, but I did show that in human corneal epithelium it seems to matter as well. Um, obviously, you would have to do, well, you couldn't do those experiments. Uh, then I'm going to leave you with a few questions, just foods for thought. Um, and so first, will inhibiting toll-like receptors decrease complications of herpetic infections of the cornea? I don't show the data, um, but groups have shown that toll-like receptor 2 and even toll-like receptor 9 seem to draw, drive a very pro-inflammatory state. So is it possible in the cornea that when you have toll-like receptor 2, 3, 9, IFI 16, P204, all being activated by HSV, we clearly show that P204 is the antiviral innate sensor responsible for antiviral immunity, but are these other sensors just driving a pro-inflammatory state? So could you specifically target, so instead of using glucocorticoids, could you specifically target toll-like receptors to decrease the pro-inflammatory state and hopefully the pathology that you see with herpetic infections of the cornea? That's anybody's guess at this point, but that would be at least be um, you know, something plausible uh, with toll-like receptor uh, antagonists on the market um, at this point. Um, and then the second half of that question is the entire immune response a good thing. Um, and I've actually uh, written on this subject before, but in the central nervous system, it's definitely, it's clear that the innate immune, or the entire immune system, if you add in the adaptive side of things, that there's a pathological side of the immune system but then there's an important antiviral portion of the immune system. And so these patients, they get long-term neurological pathology. It's likely due not to the virus. I mean, the virus is activating the immune system, but it's actually likely due to the immune system trying to clear the virus. Uh, so you're actually getting that central nervous system pathology due to that. Um, and that's actually being tested in a huge clinical trial in Europe where they're using glucocorticoids in herpetic encephalitis patients. Uh, then the next question, it's probably true, um, but we haven't tested that, so I can't say that it is. But does P204 IFI 16 drive innate immunity to VSV, so zoster? And so they're uh, both alpha herpes viruses, and so they're very, very similar when it comes to structure of the viruses themselves. 
Um, and so it's likely that this is the same sensor for both viruses. And so if you were to change therapy, you would change it for both. Then lastly, um, kind of a, the biggest question for thought, will HSV vaccination attempts to activate this innate sensor produce an efficacious vaccine? And then furthermore, could you actually design a vaccine that you could take into third world countries that's actually a topical eye drop vaccine that would be much easier to take than a bunch of syringes? Um, only time would tell if you could actually do that and not induce pathology in the eye. Um, but it does seem plausible at this point. My mentor is actually not necessarily testing, well, he is, I guess, testing um, a live attenuated virus, very attenuated, um, to see if you can actually activate this immune response. Then I'm only going to touch on one other thing because our lab um, has shown this quite clearly. Um, I've done a little bit of work on this, but it was actually another graduate student in our lab, that if you don't contain the virus early, you get an increase in the amount of lymphatic vessels into the cornea. Uh, and so from the pathological side, early antiviral containment is crucial. Um, and interestingly, this story actually goes back to uh, HSV protein actually dr specifically drives VEGF-A production to drive lymphatic growth into the cornea. And that's all been shown by this previous graduate student, but it just hounds on the idea that you have to contain this virus early or you're going to have long-term complications. Um, and then here are my citations. Uh, you can look those up if you'd like. Um, and then I have to give thanks to a lot of people, and I boil it down to just a few people, mainly from the people in my lab. But let me just point out two people. Um, first, my mentor, Dr. Dan Carr at the Dean McGee Eye Institute, and then a technician in the lab, Min Zhang, that was absolutely phenomenal and let me do a lot of this work that I probably wouldn't have been able to do with my own hands. Um, and then with that said, uh, Dr. Wong asked me to put up um, some pictures of myself. She actually wanted me as a kamikaze something. I don't know when I was a kid. I didn't have any of those. And so this uh, actually, I guess my honeymoon with my wife, uh, where we're actually in Australia um, river rafting. And here I am playing, I guess, uh, a paddle guitar, and then my wife, I guess, right here is, I guess, about to bring the hammer down on somebody with her paddle. Uh, so with that said, any questions uh, I can take at this point? Dr. Harris. So live attenuated. So when you give live attenuated viruses, if you actually look at almost every viral vaccine, they're live attenuated viruses. The one example, uh, well, there's two that come to mind that aren't. So the flu vaccine, uh, you can actually get that intranasally, so it's live attenuated. Or um, also polio. Um, and so I would actually argue that in the polio vaccine, the live attenuated pill is actually better for you because it activates the proper innate system. And actually, now in the US, we're giving injections. So it's not as efficacious, and there's literature that actually shows that. Um, but it would probably be due to the fact that you're actually having that viral life cycle to activate the proper innate immune system. And so if it is IFI 16 P204, you would actually have to have DNA from the virus presented to the cytoplasmic nuclear sensor. So the viral life cycle is absolutely critical. And so in previous vaccine attempts with HSV, they've done protein based vaccines, and those, like I said, they make you actually more susceptible to the virus, and so it's probably due to the fact that you're actually getting um, uh, this actual viral life cycle uh, to induce the immune system. So, yes, Dr. Wong. They're coming around now. Um, we had to get to the point where we had to have someone pretty big in the field uh, help us with a couple of experiments. Um, she was actually the one that identified IFI 16 P204. Um, and so she's in a, she works in a lab at UMass. Um, and so we had her do an experiment for us, more as like 
hey, can you check our work because reviewers are absolutely just slamming this idea. And it was the same guy over and over again because you could tell from the writing um, in these reviews. Uh, and so once she signed off on it and did this experiment for us, it was like, oh, well, if she signed off on it, it must be true. Um, because this little Dean McGee lab in the middle of Oklahoma doesn't know what they're talking about. But now that someone from UMass that's published, you know, huge, huge papers in the field, now that she is actually signing off on it and has done some of the work. Um, well, I say she did some of the work. She basically confirmed in her lab that what we were seeing was the same thing. And so, uh, yeah, from that, uh, they're finally catching on. It's actually um, becoming more prominent in the field now. So we'll see. Time will tell. Yes. Uh, well, so P204, IFI16 hasn't been shown to directly activate those proteins, but what it does is it activates interferon. Interferon then binds to the heterodimeric interferon receptor, then signals through the JAK STAT pathway to induce MHC class 1 expression. Uh, keep in mind that MHC is always expressed, class 1 is always expressed on cells, but it's actually upregulated in, in viral infections or anytime you have interferon production. Uh, and the virus actually has specific mechanisms to downregulate the MHC class 1 expression. So it's a huge battle that I, I didn't describe here. So it's a downstream effect of this sensor, but it doesn't directly activate those two proteins. Or at least it hasn't been shown to this point, um, which uh, would be skipping a, a step in this long cascade. Uh, so it's likely not directly driving those uh, protein products or even apoptosis, um, but it is having a downstream effect of that. Thanks, is that okay? So is, your, is your goal down the road some point to do, do uh, cornea? Uh, I've thought about it, but I'm kind of uh, going back. Probably, I'll probably end up. I'm pretty interested in uveitis from the uh, innate side, but honestly. I have a more basic science question okay. that's why I saved it. So you mentioned that it, that your lab or that you believe that it was actually a DNA sensor and not an RNA sensor. Right. Um, did I mishear it when it seemed like the IFI 16 was more with the DNA and the P24 was more with the RNA? No, so P204 is the mouse Oh, that's IFR. right. That's okay. right. Bec and that's so a different name. And right. Yeah. Right. So same name. That's right. Um, and so trying to keep the all the I'm yeah. trying, trying all to keep the all names the names in, in an innate short. literature. Uh, there's a name like four names for every protein. So, so then, how did you then with R? What was it with the RNA? What was their respective thing? That rig I M E H. Oh, rig rig I, and, and yeah. that was the one there. And then I noticed when you're showing the graphs, you know, 